Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Hallelujah. Sing ye hands, thou earth reply. This morning, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is risen indeed. If you're a guest this morning, thanks for coming out to be with us. We're honored to have you here. A lot of family are in town, so our prayer for you is that you'll have a safe trip when you return home. If you're from in town and you're looking for a church home, we're really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. And if there's anything we can do at Twickenham to help you, we'd love the opportunity to try to do that. We'll not uh, do any family news today. Anything you need to know is either in your bulletin or will be on the screens running uh, as a slideshow after our service. We just want to devote our time this morning to praising God and thanking Him for the resurrection He has given us. However, there is one bit of family business that we do need to take care of. Can I get the shepherds to come on up, Daniel and Jenna? Uh, Shepherd are with us this morning. And with them, their children, Sydney, Ben, and Eliza, but they also have a new one with them this morning, a little boy named Silas. Now, I don't know where you came from. We have probably folks from all over the country in town, but nobody came further to be here today than Silas did. Silas came from 6,000 miles away in China, and he is now the newest member of the Shepherd family and the newest member of ours as well. So we're going to begin today. We're going to begin today with a prayer welcoming Silas to our family, and it's a great way for us to celebrate Easter. It's a season of new beginnings, and it's certainly a new beginning for him and for this family. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for Daniel and Jenna and their commitment to you, their love for others. We're thankful for Sydney, who traveled with them to China. We're thankful for Ben and Eliza, and this morning we're especially thankful for Silas. God, we pray your blessings on him as he transitions from his home in China to here. 
We pray that you'll bless him as he learns our language and customs. We pray one day that we'll be able to witness his decision to make Jesus Christ his Lord and Savior and to give his life to him in baptism. We pray for Daniel and Jenna as they raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're thankful for their example of sacrifice and love and commitment to the world through you. We're thankful for their love for Silas, and we pray your blessings on their marriage, on their parenting, on their family in every conceivable way. In Jesus' name, we lift this prayer and let the whole church say amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Let's uh, stand together, please, and hear the word of the Lord from Philippians chapter 2 as we prepare to celebrate and crown Jesus as our King. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. Let's praise him together. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem, all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for me. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Majesty, Lord of all, let every throne before him fall. The King of kings, O oh, come adore our God who reigns.
the appropriate time in this responsive prayer. O Christ, in your resurrection, the heavens and earth rejoice. Alleluia. By your resurrection, you broke open the gates of hell and destroyed sin and death. Keep us victorious over sin. By your resurrection, you raised the dead and brought us from death to life. Guide us in the way of eternal life. By your resurrection, you confounded your guards and executioners and filled the disciples with joy. Give us joy in your service. By your resurrection, you proclaimed good news to the women and apostles and brought salvation to the whole world. Direct our lives as your new creation. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone be breaks the bread, the Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead, the one we love the most is now our gracious host, come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord, we are now a family of which glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the As we share the Lord in this meal, communion, let's remember his death and resurrection, and we'll be doing it from the Jesus Storybook Bible this morning. The sun stops shining. So you're a king, are you? The Roman soldiers jeered. Then you'll need a crown and a robe. They gave Jesus a crown made out of thorns and put a purple robe on him and pretended to bow down to him. Your majesty, they said. Then they whipped him and spat on him. They didn't understand that this was the prince of life, the king of heaven and earth, who had come to rescue them. The soldiers made him a sign, our king, it said, and nailed it to a wooden cross. They walked up a hill outside the city, and Jesus carried the cross on his back. Jesus had never done anything wrong, but they were going to kill him the way that criminals were killed. 
They nailed Jesus to the cross. Father, forgive them, Jesus gasped. They don't understand what they're doing. You say you've come to rescue us, people shouted, but you can't even rescue yourself. But they were wrong. Jesus could have rescued himself. A legion of angels would have flown to his side if he'd called. If you were really the son of God, you could just climb down off that cross, they said. And of course, they were right. Jesus could have just climbed down. Actually, he could have just said a word and made it all stop. Like when he healed that little girl and stilled the storm and fed 5,000 people. But Jesus stayed. You see, they didn't understand. It wasn't the nails that kept Jesus there. It was love. Papa, Jesus cried, frantically searching the sky. Papa, where are you? Don't leave me. And for the first time and the last, when he spoke, nothing happened. Just a horrible, endless silence. God didn't answer. He turned away from his boy. Tears rolled down Jesus' face, the face of the one who would wipe away every tear from every eye. And even though it was midday, a dreadful darkness covered the face of the world. The sun could not shine, the earth trembled and quake, the great mountains shook, rocks split in two, until it seemed that the world, the whole world would break, that creation itself would tear apart. The full force of the storm of God's fierce anger at sin was coming down on his own son instead of his people. It was the only way God could destroy sin and not destroy his children whose hearts were filled with sin. Then Jesus shouted out in a loud voice, it is finished. And it was, he had done it. Jesus had rescued the whole world. Father, Jesus cried, I give you my life. And with a great sigh, he let himself die. Strange clouds and shadows filled the sky, purple, orange, black, like a bruise. Jesus' friends gently carried Jesus. They laid Jesus in a new tomb carved out of rock. How could Jesus die? What had gone wrong? What did it mean? They didn't know anything anymore, except they did know that their hearts were breaking. That's the end of Jesus, the leaders said. But just to be sure, they sent strong soldiers to guard the tomb. They hauled a huge stone in front of the door to the tomb so that no one could get in or out. Let's pray. Father, as we take communion together, we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, the sacrifice that you made with your only son. We remember his death and take this bread. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Soon and very soon, my King is coming, robed in righteousness and crowned with love. When I see Him, I shall be made like Him soon and very soon. I will be with the one I love, with unveiled face I'll see Him. There my soul will be satisfied soon and very soon. That's not the end. God's wonderful surprise. Jesus' friends were sad. They would never see their best friend again. How could this happen? Wasn't Jesus the rescuer, the king God had promised? It wasn't supposed to end like this. Yes, but whoever said anything about the end? Just before sunrise on the third day, God sent an earthquake and an angel from heaven. When the guards saw the angel, they fell down with fright. The angel rolled the huge stone away and sat on top of it, waiting. At the first glimmer of dawn, Mary and other women headed to the tomb to wash Jesus' body. The early morning sun slanted through the ancient olive trees, drops of dew glittering on leaves and grasses, little tears everywhere. The friends walked quietly along the hilly path through the olive groves until they reached the tomb and immediately noticed something odd. It was wide open. They peered through the opening into the dark tomb. But wait, Jesus' body was gone. And something else. A shining man was there with clothes made from lightning. Don't be scared, the angel said. But they couldn't help it. They screamed anyway. The angel asked them, what are you doing here? This is a tomb and tombs are for dead people. The women couldn't speak. Jesus isn't dead anymore, he said. He's alive again. And their hearts leapt. And when the angel laughed with such gladness that they felt for a moment as if they had woken from a nightmare. The other women rushed home, but Mary stayed behind. How could it be true? Jesus was definitely dead. How could he be alive? Just then, Mary heard someone else in the garden. Perhaps it's the gardener, she thought. He'll know where Jesus' body is. I don't know where Jesus is, Mary said urgently. I can't find him. But it was all right. Jesus knew where she was, and he had found her. Mary. Only one person said her name like that. She could hear her heart thumping. She turned around. She could just make out a figure. She shaded her eyes to see and thought she was dreaming. But she wasn't dreaming. She was seeing. Jesus. Mary fell to the ground. Sudden tears filled her eyes and great sobs shook her whole body. And all she wanted in that moment was to cling to Jesus and never let him go. You'll be able to hold on to me later, Mary, Jesus said gently, and always be close to me. But now go and tell the others that I am alive. Let's pray. God, we celebrate today that you are alive in us. You are alive in us through your son. And we're so thankful that the tomb could not hold him. That death has no victory over him. That death has no victory over us because of him. And we celebrate that this morning. And we cannot wait to cling to you and never let you go. This morning we celebrate what is to come. We remember you. We remember your body and your blood. And we take this cup now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
soon and very soon I'll be going to the place he has prepared for me there my sin erased my shame forgotten soon and very soon I will be The angels and the elders round the throne At his feet I'll lay my crowns, my worship Soon and very soon I will be Dressed in glory, not my own. What a joy I'll sing of on that day. No more tears or broken dreams. Forgotten is the minor key. Everything as it was meant to be. And we will worship, worship. Forever in your presence we will sing, we will worship, worship you, an endless hallelujah to the King. I will see you as you are, love you with unsinning heart. See how much you pay to bring me home. Not till then, Lord, shall I know. Not till then, how much I owe. Everything I am before your throne. And we will worship, worship. Forever in your presence we will sing. you an endless hallelujah to the king no more tears no more shame no more sin and sorrow ever known again no more fears no more pain we will see you face to face face to face, and we will worship, worship, forever in your presence. 
words we will sing, we will worship, worship you, an endless hallelujah to the King. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And we will worship, worship, forever in your presence we will sing. We will worship, worship you. An endless hallelujah to the King. An endless hallelujah to the King. An endless hallelujah to the King. You know, I don't know about you, but I could sure use a hug. Let's take a moment, stand, and give somebody a hug and a handshake, and then we'll continue with our time of praise. Call them and get them back. Are you serious? Yes. Let me worship. Yes, well, we will worship. One more. One more chorus. One more chorus to get them out of the, this, okay? We needed some... And we will worship, worship, forever in your presence we will sing. We will worship, worship you, an endless hallelujah to the King. An endless hallelujah to the King. An endless hallelujah to the King. Amen. Be seated, seated, please. Thank you. It, it, it looks like bring a friend day in the balcony. How are you guys doing up there? There is no greater story in sports or entertainment, in business, in medicine, in life, than a comeback story. Now, I know some of you guys have been watching the basketball tournaments. Texas A&M wrote one of the greatest in basketball history last week, coming from a 12-point deficit with like 40-something seconds on the clock to tie it up. Uh, over northern Iowa and then win in overtime. I, I'll just be honest with you. I, I don't even like NCAA basketball, and I thought that was incredible. I, even I got excited about that one. Uh, my, a personal favorite comeback story of mine in the entertainment world is Robert Downey Jr., who came back from drug addiction, multiple arrests, professional oblivion to become the coolest superhero ever in Iron Man. A few years ago, um, Sports Illustrated published a list of the greatest comebacks of all time, and it was a very eclectic list. Elvis Presley was on the list uh, because of his 1968 TV special, which was a huge comeback for him. Muhammad Ali made the list, uh, came back from a seven-year exile to reclaim the title. Harry Truman made the cut owing to his 1948 victory over Thomas Dewey with, when all the polls and the newspapers said that he was going to lose. 
Even humanity was on the list for recovering from the Black Plague of the 14th century when over 25 million Europeans died. But their number one greatest comeback of all time, named by the editors of Sports Illustrated magazine in the November 12, 2001 issue, was Jesus Christ, AD 33, stuns Romans, defies critics by his resurrection from the grave. Now, I don't know if they really believe that or if they were just trolling. And I seriously doubt that 15 years later they'd mention his name in something other than a quote from a Christian athlete, and maybe not even then. But Jesus' resurrection is hands down the greatest comeback ever. Not just because it's a bigger feat to rise from the dead than to revive a sagging career or overcome a superior opponent or score 12 points in 48 seconds. His resurrection is the greatest comeback ever because it produced an impact more far-reaching than any other in history. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. We still debate it. We're still feeling the effects of that event 20 centuries after it happened. I want to say a word here uh, to you. If you are among those who have their doubts, about whether Jesus literally rose from the dead. And maybe it's less than doubt. Maybe you just don't think that can happen. First of all, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I think it speaks well of you that you'd be willing to come here when you actually harbor doubts about it. And I want to say that having doubts doesn't make you a bad person. Whether you've experienced death up close and personal or not, you know that it's real, you know that it's final, you know that it's permanent. And I'll just, I'll be real honest with you, okay? The claim that Jesus rose from the dead is hard to believe. It goes against everything we know. There are a ton of scientists in this room, okay? This is a city full of scientists. This is a church full of them. And we know how life works. So I will grant you it is hard to believe. But if you're open... I would, I would love for you to give us the opportunity to talk with you about why we believe against all the science that it really happened. The claim that Jesus rose from the dead is hard to believe, but there are some really solid reasons to believe that, and we'd be more than willing to sit down and talk with you about it. So, but, but thank you for being here today. That, that's important. This morning, we're going to look at three ways that Jesus come back has a powerful effect on our lives. And we're going to pause along the way to reflect on each of these ways, either in song or or scripture. So first I want us to to think about, we're going to start at the end and work our way back, okay? I want us to think about how what happened 2,000 years ago affects our future. Some of us in this room never think about death. And some of us never stop thinking about it. I don't mean to steal your Easter joy or take anything away from the service, but you, you do know you're going to die one day, right? I mean, if, now, if life unfolds the way we expect it to, if life develops for us the way we think it ought to, sort of on schedule, we, we, we get sort of eased into accepting the reality and inevitability of our own demise. First, friends of your grandparents pass away. And these are, these are people you've heard stories about. These are people you're aware of, but you're not really connected to them. So when they pass, it's almost like news from a distant land you've never visited. It matters, you're certain, but it just it really doesn't change much in your world. And then one of your grandparents passes away, and then all of a sudden it matters a great deal. It's personal now. If your experience of a grandparent's death is anything like mine, I had two grandfathers pass away within a month of each other. In November 
And then December 1969, Christmas Day, in fact, 1969, my, one of my grandfathers passed away. Within a month of each other, I remember that as a time of very confused emotions, of not knowing what to do with myself, and a sense that I had just grown up a little bit, and I didn't like it very much. If your life proceeds in, a, in typical fashion, in the way we want it to, on schedule, the next stage will see friends of your parents passing away. Now, these are not just people you've heard of. These are people who helped raise you. You played in their backyard and you ate at their table and they brought you home from school or practice or church and now they're gone. And then it's your parents who pass. And you're the one standing in the reception line at the funeral and you're the one standing under the tent tossing in the handful of dirt or putting a flower on the casket. It's you. And then one day you see a notice on Facebook that an old classmate of yours has died. He's the one you told your grandchildren about. They never met him, but they laughed at the story. And suddenly, slowly you begin to realize that before long it's going to be you. And your grandchildren will grow up a little bit. And they won't like it either. And sometimes, life doesn't unfold the way we expect. Things don't happen on schedule. Sometimes people pass out of order. Somebody says, I'll see you tomorrow, but tomorrow never comes for them. Sometimes parents bury children. Sometimes people die all too soon. We call those untimely. Death is life's dark reality. It is the unavoidable appointment every one of us must keep. It is the thing that goes bump in the soul. Unless your soul has been given to Jesus. Because his resurrection, his comeback, changes your future. Paul hints at this in the book of Ephesians. We've been in a series called Identity who we really are in Jesus Christ. It's in, the, it's in the book of Ephesians. If you haven't been here with us, come back next week because we're going to talk about some things that a lot, of, a lot of people are going to disagree with, okay? It should be a lot of fun next week. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul hints at this idea that God's done something for you in your future. He says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the, the good news of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And now he begins to talk about this future, having believed in him, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who were God's possession. Two words invite hope about the future here. The words guaranteeing and inheritance. Paul is hinting that there is something beyond this life for those of us who believe, and it is a sure thing. Now what Paul hints at, another apostle, Peter, comes right out and says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, he writes, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a, and I love this right here, into a living hope. Hope is all about the future. He has given us new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's this whole Easter thing, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance, same word that Paul used, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Paul said that inheritance was guaranteed. Peter says that inheritance is imperishable and permanent. If you are a Christian... Because of the resurrection, death is not your executioner. It is the executor of the will. It's the means by which you and I receive our inheritance. If you are a Christian, because of the resurrection, death is not the period at the end of your story. It's the turning to a new chapter. If you are a Christian, because of the resurrection, Death is not the end of the road. It is the entrance ramp to eternity. If you are a Christian, because of the resurrection, death is not your enemy. It's your escort to eternal life. 
If you are a Christian, because of the resurrection, death is not your defeat. It is the beginning of your comeback. Peter says this living hope, the imperishable inheritance, is kept in heaven for us who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is, that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And then he says this, in this you greatly rejoice. I want us to stand together right now, and I want us to greatly rejoice about this inheritance that he has given us. Let's stand and let's sing about that inheritance. That There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come? When I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done, is that his voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? Is he calling me? I will rise up, rise up, and bow down, and lay my crown at his wounded feet. There's a stirring deep within me, could it be my time? When I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done, is that his voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? Is he calling me? that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. Jesus' comeback is the plot line of every Christian story. But it's not just about the future. Eternal life starts now. The power God used to raise Jesus from the grave is available to us here, now. The future is assured, but the present is empowered. If God could raise Jesus from the dead, he can restore your marriage. If God could roll away the stone that sealed Jesus' tomb, he can reconcile our broken relationships. If God could revive the dead body of his crucified son, he can rebuild our shattered lives. If God could reduce death, the ultimate finality, to a three-day pause, he can reclaim any loss, redeem any failure, repair any brokenness. Jesus' resurrection guarantees our future, but it empowers the present as well. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayal. Sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing 
to the Father's will. He took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor unto Thee. Sent of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who my salvation where your blood poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee now my debt is paid it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus will. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Yes, now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor unto Thee. See, the stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah. resurrection of Jesus guarantees our future, and it empowers us for, for present struggles, helps us able to endure and overcome them, but there's one other way the resurrection impacts us. Listen to this from Ephesians chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 1, and I want you to pay attention to the tense of the verbs. As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But 
because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Because the tomb of Jesus is empty, your history no longer determines your destiny. You are no longer defined by your past. Yesterday does not decide your tomorrow. Let that sink in for just a moment. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, no matter what you have done, no matter what you have done, the resurrection means that your past has been forgiven. Your history has been revised. Your record has been expunged. Your sentence has been served. The sin that shackled you to your past like chains ha has been broken and you are free. Jesus' comeback makes yours and mine possible. Five years ago, the world's greatest golfer at the time, Tiger Woods, suffered a humiliating and very public moral failure, series of moral failures. Every attempt at a professional and personal comeback has been a disappointment. Shortly after Woods' scandals broke, Broadcaster Britt Hume was asked to comment on Mr. Wood's troubles. Hume said that he believed that Tiger's best chance at recovery, and this is a, a news broadcaster, okay, who says this. Britt Hume said that he felt like Tiger's best chance at recovery was to turn from Buddhism, the faith that he practiced, to the Christian faith. Hume said that in his opinion, only the Christian faith offered the kind of forgiveness and redemption that could help Mr. Woods make a total recovery. Not surprisingly, Mr. Hume was criticized more for his comments than Mr. Woods was for his issues. But I gotta tell you, I agree with him. Shortly after Tiger's meltdown, um, somebody at the Huffington Post thought it would be a good idea to ask a Buddhist monk to help explain how they handle failure and recovery in Buddhism. The Buddhist monk said, in, in Buddhism, if you make a mess, you have to clean it up. We talked about this briefly last week. In Hinduism, you have the concept of karma. You get what you got coming to you. Actually, you get what somebody else got coming to them in another lifetime. In Islam, there is no concept of one person redeeming another. We all stand or fall on our own. So you tell me, which faith has more power to redeem your past? Clean up your own mess? Deal with what's coming to you? You're on your own? Or the one Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The empty tomb can free you from the power of your past. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, your past can be handled. Paul, the author of Ephesians, certainly knew what it was to be liberated from the failures of the past. At one point, he said, I'm the worst sinner that ever lived. So he, he knew what it was like to be liberated. And so did another apostle of Jesus, Peter. When Jesus needed him the most, Peter denied him three times. That's the kind of failure that could stick with you for the rest of your life. It could haunt you until the day you die, 
and even after. But like Paul, Peter experienced something that set him free from the past. Watch this video. Let me tell you a story. You may not believe me. I barely believe it myself. But I can't dispute what my soul knows. Peter! John! It's all true. Come see this! Everything he said. The tomb! Every impossible detail. It's empty! It's all true. There may be days when we deny. I don't know him. When our faith loses its footing. You have me confused. I don't know him. And we stumble along our way. I said I don't know him! been found what has been defeated what has been forgiven what was once dead has new life What was once old has been made new. What was once finite has been made eternal. May we remember and follow the risen way. Because the tomb is empty, your history no longer determines your destiny. You are no longer defined by your past. Because the tomb is empty, yesterday does not decide your tomorrow. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, no matter what you have done, the resurrection means that your past is forgiven. Your history has been revised, your record has been expunged, your sentence has been served, the sins that shackled you to your past like chains have been broken and you are free. Jesus' comeback guarantees yours. Let's sing together. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of 
Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear Brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Happy Easter, brothers and sisters. Be blessed and make it a great week for our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for coming today.